Hello and welcome to Tile Capes, the podcast that covers film, television, comics, and games. I'm your host, Cody Nestor, and alongside me is my co-host, Todd Heal. What's going on, guys? Uh, if you're enjoying the show, please consider following us on your podcast platform of choice and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Today we're talking about Rebel Moon Part 1, A Child of Fire, and Aquaman in the Lost Kingdom. When a colony on the edge of the galaxy finds itself threatened by the armies of the tyrannical regent Balisarius, they dispatch a young woman with a mysterious past to seek out warriors from neighboring planets to help them take a stand. Rebel Moon Part 1, A Child of Fire, was released on December 15th, 2023, on a budget of $166 million for Parts 1 and 2. We'll never know if Netflix uh, make their money back because they'll always say, well, you know, it was the best streaming thing for like two weeks. And right. <laughs> like eight people watched it and some <coughs> some guy in New Orleans watched it 86 times. It's like the biggest, it's, it's huge. <laughs> it's the biggest thing ever. That's what Netflix does. They have a nice way of covering their tracks. Yeah, we'll never know if it made any money. <laughs> uh, it has a Rotten Tomato score of 23%, an audience score of 69%. So let's talk non-spoilers, Todd. What did you think of Rebel Moon Part 1? I got to be upfront and honest with you folks right from the get go. This has been a long ass week for me. <laughs> Yesterday was a long ass day. So when I finally got to sit down to watch this, I got comfortable. Old Tidy nodded off a couple, three times. I, I'm not going to lie to you. I could see that. <laughs> Even without having a long, <laughs> difficult week at work, I could, all, I could see someone right? nodding off during this film. It's just to me. Uh, and here's the thing, it's kind of two parts. If you're Zack Snyder, this is kind of was billed as Zack Snyder's Star Wars. Why do you want to draw that much heat down on yourself? <laughs> right. And two, in a in a day and age when, you know, being Star Wars maybe ain't as good as it used to be, you know, some of that stuff is, like anything here lately, has been a lot of hit and a lot of miss. Uh, yeah, the shine has wore off the franchise a little bit yeah. in itself. Why do you want to put that on yourself? <laughs> so, uh you know, kind of uh, mi mixed emotions here. It's kind of uh, what you come to expect from Zach. You got uh, some amazing visuals. Uh, I think there was that one scene where, uh, spoiler alert, she's still part of the uh, the the the, uh, the, uh, the alliance, the the the, uh, the dark side. I'm gonna call it, it. Uh, the, the dark side. The empire. <laughs> I think it's like the Imperium or the Imperial or something yeah, like she's that. She's still like a, a soldier or a general on that, and then there's like a battlefield scene where she's shooting. There's all kinds of carnage going on around her. It looks great, but you know, uh, story beats, uh, dialogue, storytelling. Some of the things that I think Zach's kind of struggled with at times from the get go. I think they're still prevalent here. Right. Would you uh, would you give it a recommendation for people to watch? If you already subscribed to Netflix, you ain't got nothing else you want to do, you got a couple hours to kill, go for it. Right. Don't subscribe to Netflix just to watch this. Right. So uh, let, let me start by saying I don't I don't hate the man. I don't hate the, the person. By all accounts, Zack Snyder seems to be a pretty decent guy. Right. Never really heard anything about him being any kind of sex pest or doing weird stuff or being an asshole or anything. Seems yeah. seems to be a pretty good guy. So let me just say, don't I don't hate the guy. I have some, some very distinct problems with the filmmaking here, and I have a lot of problems with this film. Um, but if you're looking for my non-spoiler take on this, this is garbage. <laughs> And I'm dead serious. And people right. may, this may drive people if, if they're listening to us and they're fans. It may, you may think, well, man, if Cody hates it this much, like I got to check it out and see how bad this is. Don't. <laughs> Don't waste your time on this. Right. I, I very much wanted to just cut it off after about 30 minutes. And and Todd, I don't I don't want to disagree with you too harshly. This looks like shit. Todd. <laughs> Did you notice the wide shot blurry images? Oh yeah, I got that. And the insistence on on slow mo stuff, still slow mo. We'll, stuff. we'll get into that <laughs> too. But like, yes, it it is a blurry, ugly mess, <laughs> and it is contrived and derivative. And like you said, it is. Um, you know, I got it in my notes, but it, it is not only, uh, this was sold as Zack Snyder doing a science fiction film inspired by Star Wars, right? inspired by Sam, Sam, Seven Samurai and Kurosawa. Mm -hmm. This is Zack Snyder fucking ripping those films off, <laughs> both of those films off right. to complete, utter, just a complete, utter disaster, if you're asking me. And I'm not a Zack Snyder hater. I 
think he's made some pretty good films. Yeah, I would he's agree. made a few shit films. Right. Like I enjoy Watchmen. I enjoyed that. Uh, didn't enjoy Batman versus Superman. Didn't care for Man of Steel. Uh, I really enjoyed the Snyder Cut of Justice League. Far superior than what we got that travesty train wreck that was released in theaters for right. that film. Exactly. So I don't hate the guy. Three hundred, another great one. Uh-huh. He's had some hits. He's had some misses. This is a swing and a miss for me. Total misfire. It's a total misfire. I was, I was, the, you know, I think, um, you know, overall, I think this may be the the my the, the film that I like the least out of everything we've seen this year. If that tells you anything. Wow. So, folks, I don't feel so bad for nodding off now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, this does not get a recommendation from me. I mean. I would I would not advise you to, to spend your time or your money. So definitely don't subscribe to Netflix to watch this. Yeah. And there's a lot more other things that can be watched and enjoyed right now other than this. So it's a, it's a skip from, from anybody that hasn't seen it if you want my opinion about it. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's get into things a little bit deeper here, Todd. Let's kind of go into uh, a little bit more in-depth and uh, kind of discuss uh, Rebel Moon Part 1, okay? Okay. Uh, spoilers are ahead for this, so uh, where, where do you want to start here, Todd? And I'll throw it to you first. So, uh, basically, uh, I turned her on, and uh, we get the little opening narrative. We see the ships in space, and we go to, like, the, uh, it looks like the farming colony planet they're on. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've just had a... Veilt, I think, I think is the yeah, name. Yeah, I think they just had, like, a major harvest come in. They're kind of celebrating, you know, having a good time. Uh, we meet our our, um, our uh, major character uh, played by it's uh, Sophia Butellas. Mm-hmm. I don't remember her name. I just know the Cora. actress's name. Yes, yes. And then uh, you know I'm just gonna keep calling them the, the dark side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they land. Uh, we get our first glimpse of like their uh, general looking guy. Kind of looks like a cross between uh, Major Bison from Street Fighter and Lloyd from uh, Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> the haircut. He does. <laughs> he does. It's a very good. Uh, it's a very good analogy there. I think his name is Admiral Admiral Noble. Yeah. I kind of wove some comedy into some of these characters. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. So uh, you know, this we meet. Film is a joke. Yeah, so. so uh, we basically we meet uh, their chief, and uh, you know they're they're there wanting to uh, get some support for their uh, trying to fight a, a rebel a rebel alliance that's kind of taken up against them. They want some grain, they want some food to kind of back them, and he's basically telling them, well, you know, we don't have any extra. We've got what we've got, and that's barely enough to feed us. But which I is get, a lie. Which is a lie because like their major, I guess he's their harvester guy, the guy that does gunner. The, yeah, yeah. I guess I'll call him like the dude. It looks like the dude from Andor, but it's not the dude from Andor. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> fair, fair. Yeah, yeah. He's like, well, you know, after he hears like their little pitch for you know, like, hey, we'll we'll pay you three times what this stuff is worth. You know, you can get you some decent equipment. You ain't gotta harvest this stuff yourself. And he's like, well. Maybe we do have a little bit left over. Maybe we can hook you up. Right. Yeah. And then and then the background to this, Cora, we kind of learn about her backstory a little bit in terms of uh, there's some old man in the village that she's close with. It kind of through their interactions that we he kind of tells us that he, I guess she crash landed on the planet. Right. Uh uh, we learn at some point, we don't know why, but we learn later that she is a, a fugitive of some sort from whatever it is, the Imperium, the Empire. We're gonna, just going to call him the Empire. We'll call him the Empire, and, folks. Uh, it's easier for me, I he, know. He kind of <laughs> rescued her and kind of saved her, brought her to the village, and they've kind of taken her in and sheltered her and kind of give her a, a home and a, and a family of sort. And uh, things go bad, as you say, when the uh, the uh, the Empire comes down looking for some grain. Corey Stoll, for whatever reason... Uh, he's the uh, the one that plays their 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 leader. I think his name is Sindri, if I'm not mistaken. I think you're correct. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, Sindri. Um, yeah, uh, Admiral Noble ends up caving his head in with whatever stick walking cane he has, kind of thing. <laughs> right. That's his main weapon. Is, is some his kind walking of, stick? Is his walking stick? He bashes his brains in with it, and then basically tells them that you're going to give us basically more grain than you could afford to ever give us. That probably you're going to end up starving to death. And Admiral Noble and them, they fuck off and they leave about seven to eight or the wor- the most like generic cliche soldiers. Yeah, like just you just the, know what's coming. The old bad boys, you know. Yeah, like looking hey, for trouble, fighting yeah, amongst themselves. Exactly. Like, hey, we're gonna like, yeah, exactly. We're 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 breaking each other's balls and there's one that's always gotta push it too far and take things too far. Hey, we're gonna rape this girl that gets us water and uh, all this kind of bullshit. Oh, and, and they got that little robot, was it? 
Who was that voice? Was Anthony that? Hopkins. That's right. So that's why I called him Ten Cannibal Lecter. <laughs> <laughs> so Ten Cannibal Lecters. <laughs> yeah, Ten Cannibal Lecter. He's. Uh, I don't know what how they what they refer to him. They call him uh, the the stupid grunt soldiers call him a Jimmy. When I'm like, hey, they left us a Jimmy, and I'm like, wow, a condom. <laughs> I, I'm like, you know, I don't know, and like, but I I don't know what they refer to those robots as, but like. Uh, he he's kind ten of, cannibal. Lecter. Yeah, ten cannibal lector. He kind of uh, the, the robot kind of develops a little bit of relationship with the water girl, right? Yeah, and kind of starts. Uh, I guess they say that they were kind of, I guess, uh, you know, kind of uh, guards of the uh, emperor or whatever the the commanding person, the the king. I guess actually they refer yeah. to him as a king. They were kind of servants and, and personal guards to the king and those kind of things. And after the king in this universe, the king was assassinated. Their fallen king. Uh, they those robots they all decided to just lay down their arms and none of them have uh, picked up arms or fought or you know did anything in battle since that point. Right. So they're kind of like become pacifists uh, almost. And uh, the kind of inciting incident is like I was saying they the the. The grunts that have to push things too far. Of course, they want to like you know try Get to a little frisky with the water girl. Yeah, they want to they want to rape the water girl in the barn. Cora kind of hears her screams, goes out there. She uh, starts to kind of try to take them out. There's also one because again, it's a, a cliche uh, in the in this type of scenario. There's like the one. Uh, soldier that objects to this yeah he don't want to go along with it exactly so he's trying to fight back he's helping core a little bit to have a little bit of a shootout in the barn um till it's down to the last kind of commanding officer and oh who comes in it's 10 candle elector to shoot him in the head <laughs> to save the uh the little water girl basically yeah and kind of before that the town they kind of got together and they're like hey you know we're good at you know we're farmers that's our thing we'll just keep producing this product we'll keep pumping it out we'll keep them happy well, you know, we'll keep them satisfied. And she has that little run in, kills all of them. She's like, yeah, we're going to have to fight them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know what, guys? Uh, I think we're going to have to fight. We're going to uh, have to fight. Because I just killed all eight of them in this barn. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the little plan to just uh, kind of pacify them, uh, that's out the window. Uh, I just, again, the, there's, I'm going to go kind of go through my notes and kind of go through it here. But just like the opening, like, again, it looks terrible. The little planet, and that's a big problem with this film in general, is that there's no world building. Everywhere they go feels empty. Right. It feels like someone on a set or a soundstage or in the volume with a, a CGI background for the most part. Yeah. It's just a lot of nothing and nowhere. Like, it just, and a lot of just very contrived, convenient occurrences, which I'll kind of kind of get into as I kind of go through it. But what's, um, from there, it's, uh, you know, like you said, they they get they all get together and it's like well we got to do a seven samurai yeah so that, the guy that looks like the dude from Andor he's like he knows somebody that may know the rebel two main rebel people right so they kind of go on a recruiting mission uh, they go to like some western looking saloon town they go to the canteen from Star Wars they go to the canteen of Star Wars and get Captain Boomerang. What? Captain Boomerang. Charlie Hoonan. Is that his name? Charlie Hoonan? Who? Who? Who was the most Hoonan? Uh, Hoonan? Char Charlie Hunnam. Hunnam. Yes. Yeah. So he's, having, he's my Captain Boomerang. Did you have, him. were you, was it not so much that you were sleeping last night? Were you having a series of Strongs, Todd? I think I was. John Bodega? Yeah. Charlie Hoonan? I think I woke up one time and, uh, uh, Katana from Suicide Squad is fighting a spider lady. Yes. They yeah. go to Tatooine and get young Conan. Yes. 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 Yeah. I think I'm caught up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's that's really what the the middle section of the film is is um, they recruit. Let's we got to do a Seven Samurai. The it's it's it is literally a rip off of Star Wars for the most part, and the scenes that aren't a rip off of Star Wars are a rip off of Seven Samurai. It's not an it's not an inspired by take. It is a rip off take, <laughs> and it's exactly what it is. And I'm sorry, Zach. Um, I, well, I was gonna say you know you're you're a pretty good visual filmmaker, but I don't think that at all. And I saw some I got a lot of articles before this film came out. Oh, Zack Snyder built some type of like his own. Uh, link camera lens for this film just for this film he brought he, he built some kind of special camera lens return that motherfucker <laughs> maybe you should have used something that's already established yeah, and working maybe you said something yeah <laughs> something that's tested and tried and true because this blurry it made my eyes hurt wow it literally made my eyes hurt because i'm like at first i thought am i crazy i'm like is it is it something wrong with my tv 
is it a setting? Do I have motion smoothing on? Like, yeah. sorry, Tom Cruise. <laughs> uh, no, but like, it, it just it it visually it looks it looks terrible. And like, that's what Snyder used to be known for is the visuals. That's what three hundred oh, visually yeah. one of amazing the, visuals, amazing visuals, Watchmen visually appealing. I mean, even for the problems with. Man of Steel and Batman versus Superman. Amazing visuals. And you those still things. have good visuals. You know, you have a lot of muted colors and a, and a, a palette and stuff can be kind of subjective. But like the visuals were fine. But then you get to stuff like Army. Was it Army of the Dead that he did recently? Uh, maybe. Uh, this is only one of his Netflix movies I've actually watched. You didn't watched. see the one with Dave Bautista? No, I can't speak. Where they do a zombie heist? I can't speak to that one. Yeah, no. so like <laughs> it it looked terrible, and there was like issues. There was like a their scene that had a dead pixel on the screen because there was a dead pixel in the camera. Right. And like, I'm like, what is this guy doing? That's what, like, what you were known for. That's your bread and butter. That's your bread and butter because you are not a writer, Zach. Listen, Zach. You are not a good writer. Cody's going to lean in and tell you something. You are not a good writer. <laughs> Stop it. Pay someone else to write your scripts and your, do your screenplays for you because you are not a writer, my guy. I'm sorry. Go back to whatever you were doing in 2007 and 2008 visually and stop writing. <laughs> Um, but yeah, oh, I almost forgot on our recruiting trip. We go to a gladiator world and we recruit the wizard Shazam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Moving true, on. True. Yes. Uh, was it Digimon Hansu? Yeah, I, think is his I wasn't going to say that name. Uh, we recruit him. I think he's General Titus. But Titus. yeah, like you said, we get we get Charlie Hunnam, who is our Han Solo. I didn't like that accent he was trying to pull off either. I, it, it's probably his closest to his real actual accent, honestly, because I think he is Oops. Irish. <laughs> <laughs> you racist. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we get Charlie Hunnam uh, trying to be Han Solo. Uh, like trying to be a character reminiscent of Han Solo, but exactly. not not being Han Solo. He's not a uh, kind of a gunslinger or, or you know, type of character, but he is a, a thief and a smuggler. We get, uh, like you said, Conan the Barbarian uh, off of some desert planet, uh, which is a completely stupid scene. That was Tatooine. Yeah, that was that was Tatooine. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're that you're absolutely right. We get him we get Conan off of Tatooine. We get General Titus, as you mentioned. They find him in a filthy gutter somewhere and have to clean his ass up. And they only half clean him, by the way. She, she's like, Oh, take him and clean him up. And then like they're like they walk in two minutes later and he's still that's got sh- shit all over his face and all oh, that's enough. That's enough. He's fine. You only cleaned his like left arm. Like, he's fine. <laughs> he's fine. And then we get um I think her name is Nemesis. Um, that the is, one with the blades? That is our Katana okay. from Suicide Squad lady who fights the the, the spider. Um, she's probably the most visually interesting to me, at least. Yeah. I like her two kind of flame swords, I guess you Those call Those are nice, yeah. Heat up swords, nice. whatever you want to yeah. call them. Thermo blades. <laughs> Thermo blades. There you go, Todd. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> and then uh, and, and we, 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 we go to uh, another uh, planet that's completely boring and uninteresting to recruit uh, Ray Fisher to Cyborg. Oh, ah, yeah. uh, to he is the uh, what are they called? Blood axes. The the name of the rebellion group is that the one where they all look like Furiosas? They yeah, had, like the Furiosa eye makeup. Uh, makeup. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah, you're right. Um, but the one look like Lenny Kravitz. Yeah, that's Ray Fisher. Okay, yeah, Lenny yeah. Kravitz. That was my other. <laughs> that's little, that's that uh, was my other joke bomb. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> Cyborg, and we recruit him to join our team, and I think that's pretty much the team. That's the squad. And uh, the whole thing is, you know, it's a seven samurai, and the thing is, recruit recruit the team because we want them to come back to Velt to fight against Noble and whoever else he sends and their big flagship dreadnought called the King's Gaze, right? The right. big ship that's like – and the whole time I'm thinking like, how are you going to fight the King's Gaze? It's a ship that can be in low orbit that can just bomb the fuck out of you from low orbit and you've got six assholes with swords and guns. <laughs> how are, do you, Nobody has a ship except for – Blood Axe is like four little, um, you know, X wings, right, uh, right, right, so to speak, and like you don't have you don't have ships, you don't have anything. Like, I don't I don't understand how you were how you were going to win this fight. Anyway. They didn't have the firepower to take that. It's on. not like in set, yeah, it's not like in Seven Samurai where it's just like you're mostly hand to hand and with hand you know handheld weapons. Mm-hmm. You're talking about actual like space. Battle. You're talking about right. ships, and you know, like it doesn't it doesn't make any sense anyway. But luckily, 
we don't have to worry about that because that ship gets taken out in what is basically our third act. Yeah. Is uh, uh, who could have guessed it? Charlie Hoonan. Captain Boomerang. <laughs> uh, Gives them up. Ends up betraying <laughs> them. Who could have seen that coming? Uh, he ends up betraying Cora and they end up on this like he was take he was supposed supposedly taking some kind of stuff they had smuggled to some kind of planet some kind of like depot hub world he betrays them admiral noble shows up with his group in tow and the the king's gaze ends up making an appearance we have our big pew pew fight she ends up trailing him trying to take him out they have a hand to hand fight that's just underwhelming as fuck <laughs> and then at that point you think he's dead, but guess what? He's not dead, Todd. He's some kind of half-assed android, I guess. Yeah, he's in some kind of matrixy looking goo pod thing. Yeah, and earlier, did you notice he's like, I don't know how it, I thought at first like he was like some doing some kind of drugs. Yeah, he had that thing up to him. Yeah. And I, then some kind of snake thing kind of crawls around He fucked some kind of tentacle monster. Yeah. <laughs> That's the insinuation there. Right? Is he fucked some kind of hentai tentacle monster, Todd. Um, exactly. Yeah. And there's another weird scene where they're in that bar when they're in the, the cantina, and you have that, like, really, that dude that looks like you, you know? Huh? <laughs> That's like grabbing, stop the film. That's grabbing Gunner's junk. <laughs> oh, I promise grabbing. you, by the morning you'll you'll be begging me for more and that's, all that. That's very like off putting. Of, and then like you have the like just a lot of weird sex stuff in the movie that like maybe there's something is something wrong with Zach. Maybe there is something. Maybe wrong. he's not a good guy. Maybe like he ain't I said, the guy we thought. Yeah. He was. So uh, I'm gonna yeah I'm gonna take these backsies a little bit on that. <laughs> but yeah, it's just like a lot of weird sex stuff. And like the the implication is that dude has sex with some kind of tentacle monster. Yeah. That's the way I read it. Right. Did somebody else see it differently? Tell us in <laughs> the comments. Please let us know. Tell us in the comments. You can win you a shirt. You think he was fucking that octopus? Because <laughs> I think he was fucking that octopus thing. There's a like squid brain monster thing right. in that. In that, it reminds me of that episode of Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Oh yeah. Where that, where that thing like in, he like speaks through thing people by ejecting his little thing in the back oh, of yeah, the yeah, head. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. At the bar, yeah, yeah. at the cantina. Yeah, yeah. cantina. Yeah, exactly, cantina. Cantina, cantina. <laughs> Teat the tata pie. And it's like you know, it just reminds me of the Aqua Teen Hunger Force episode. Like I want four hundred one k. Uh, and it's just like I don't know. It's just it's it's just it's a mess. It is it's a complete mess. Let let me take you through my notes here, Todd, because there's okay. some stuff I want to hit on, and I know okay. I know I'm running long on uh, talking about this pile of shit. <laughs> uh, so here, here's my notes that I wrote after watching the film. Uh, just basically kind of going through it in order from start to finish. So Zach, just use an opening title crawl instead of narration if you're going to steal from Star Wars. You fucking hack. <laughs> Uh, Sindri, Corey Stoll, tells an obvious lie. He deserved to die. Uh, Corey Stoll's accent came and went anyway. So, again, another reason he deserved to die. Oh, okay. This really, this really bugged me. So, Corey tells the old man in the village that she doesn't know if she's capable of truly loving someone or being loved by them. Quote, the very idea of love, of love, of family, was beaten out of me. I was taught that love is weakness. Cora then tells Gunner later that when she was taken by Balisarius, she lived on his ship for five years and that the soldiers on board were her family. She was then educated and allowed to accompany her adoptive father on missions of diplomacy as she grew older. Of, Bar of Balisarius, she says, I was his child. I was his protege. I was his student. I was one of them, daughter of a de decorated commander, friend to the king and the royal family, living a life of privilege, no mention of love and family being beaten out of her anywhere there. Ah. Cora then says at the Academy Militarium, they encouraged us to find a lover, someone we defend with our lives. We then see Cora mourn over the body of her fallen lover. What does that sound like, Todd? That it sounds, sounds like fucking love! <laughs> It sounds like fucking love. It sounds like not only was the idea of love not beaten out of you, it was encouraged. <laughs> it was part of it. I'm telling you, who writes this shit? Zack Snyder. It bugged the fuck out of me. Like, I don't know what love is. I don't know if I can love anybody. Todd, they beat love out of me. Nah, they told me to love. They taught me to love. They encouraged Literally 20 minutes later. It was later, part of the program. It was part of the fucking program. Oh, it just bugs me. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, so Cora and Gunner conveniently arrive just in time to see Gunner's contact being taken away by bounty hunters. Ah. Cora has the aim of a stormtrooper. 
I don't know if you've noticed in that she this barely hits anybody. Yes, broadside of a barn. Uh, the brain squid is able to tell Cora exactly where the person she is looking for is. Uh, with no consideration, Cora immediately decides to trust Kai, which is Charlie Hunnam, a thief and smuggler that uh, patrons a bar filled with scum and villainy. Um, I was led to believe this film was inspired by Star Wars and Seven Samurai, but it's actually a fucking ripoff of both of these films, which we covered. <laughs> Inexplicably, the man imprisoning Tarak, so that's uh, or Tarek, whatever his name is, Conan. Gotcha, uh, gotcha. While he pays off his debt, offers to gamble his freedom if Tarak can ride a hippogriff. I don't know if you know what a hippogriff is. What are you Harry, calling me? Harry Potter fans <laughs> will get that reference. More inexplicable is the fact that Cora agrees to her entire crew becoming indentured servants if this person whom she has never met can't complete this task. Yeah, she didn't know that dude. Didn't know if he was capable of shit. Exactly. Everyone Cora encounters agrees to join her squad with almost no hesitation. There's no drama. There's no thinking it over. There's no, you help me with this and I'll join you. You son of a bitch, I mean. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the overuse of slow-mo in this film makes me want to punch myself in the balls until I can no longer feel them. <laughs> Every planet Korra visits feels completely empty. The world building in this film is shit. Uh, Kai betrays the squad and locks up everyone but Gunner because the script said so. Thank goodness that noble ship... The King's Gaze has a single pilot that sits in a World War II era front facing glass cockpit that can easily be penetrated by a man with a stick. Nice. <laughs> You're telling me that a ship that's used for interstellar travel has a glass window with the same density as a 1992 Honda Civic Todd? <laughs> that's what Zach's telling us. They, Ray Fisher takes out the whole ship, the big bad ship, with, with a, a stick. stick. And there's one pilot in a glass cockpit one on an interstellar spaceship. Yeah. It doesn't make sense, Todd. That's right. Uh, Corla, uh, Corla. Cora is clearly armed when chasing Noble, but upon jumping down to the lower platform, is completely unarmed. This is so the film can end with an underwhelming hand-to-hand -hand fight. And my last note here, this film looks like shit, a dull, lifeless, and blurry mess that literally made my eyes hurt. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Todd, uh, anything else to say about Rebel Moon Part 1 before we move on to our reviews? Uh, I mean, what is there left to say, folks? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> we rank films using a 1 to 10 scale. Starting from 1, the ranks are torture, awful, bad, 4 subpar, 5 mediocre, 6 decent, 7 good, 8 great, 9 amazing, and 10 masterpiece. So, Todd, give us your final thoughts and review score for Rebel Moon Part 1. Uh, as we have established uh, throughout our history here at Tailgates with Zack Snyder, uh, you know, a lot of his stuff can be mid-hit to miss to this one right here where it just completely falls off the map, I think. Uh, you know, where do you begin? Uh, you, you try to tie yourself to Star Wars and Seven Samurai, two classic films, two of the greatest classic films of all time. You know, and you, you just don't pull it off. You got way too much going on here at one time. Uh, when you don't, when you're known for being a visual director and you don't nail what you're known for, you're in trouble. And this part one is in trouble. I can only imagine what part two has waiting for us. I give Rebel Moon part one a three, which on our review scale is bad. All right. Um, I forgot to ask you too. Are you are you interested in a part two, Todd? I think you know my answer, but I uh, no 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 sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let, let, let me say this too about before I, before I give my score about Zach. One thing that also pisses me off about Zach Snyder, and I know the people that are going to defend this film are going to say and they're going to use. I'm so sick of Zach Snyder using the excuse of well, my four hour director's cut of this is a much better film. Like, that's going to be the narrative coming out of this. Right. Just wait till you see my, my four-hour R-rated director's cut. Then then you'll be able to appreciate this film. No, if you can't make a fucking good two-hour film, don't make it at all. <laughs> don't try to sell me on your four-hour cut. Yeah, don't sell me on your <laughs> four-hour cut and tell me that I need to watch this version and to really appreciate it. I watch, watch this two-hour film to really appreciate it. I got to go back and watch your four-hour cut of this film to make this look halfway decent. <laughs> Fuck that. I'm sick of that excuse. Listen, it worked for the Snyder Cut. 
you know, for for whatever. You got me that one time. You got me that one time, but I'm sick of this this excuse, and I I can just see it now. The defenders of this film, um, and if you enjoy it, fine. It's just my opinion. We we all have our opinions on. If you enjoy this film, fine. You're not hurting anybody. I get it, but. At the end of the day, like I just know that that's what people go. Oh, just wait till wait till they put out the R-rated four hour cut. Like then you're really going to see what Zack Snyder's vision is. No, I've saw what Zack Snyder's vision is, and I don't like. It's blurry. It. I wanted to jab my damn eyes out. It's blurry. Exactly. Um, so for me, um, uh, I give Rebel Moon Part One a two out of ten. Wee. Which is the lowest score I've ever given anything so far since we've been doing this. I think this is the lowest Tau Cape score ever. It is. It is the lowest Tau Cape score ever. I give Rebel Moon Part 1 a 2 out of 10, which ranks it as awful. Mm. It's now time to talk about Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, Todd. After failing to defeat Aquaman the first time, Black Mana wields the power of the mythic Black Trident to unleash an ancient and malevolent force. Hoping to end his reign of terror, Aquaman forges an unlikely alliance with his brother Orm, the former king of Atlantis. Setting aside their differences, they join forces to protect their kingdom and save the world from irreversible destruction. Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom was released on December 22, 2023. On a budget of $205 million, it's expected to make between $37 to $43 million over the four-day holiday weekend, which would be piss poor if that actually happens. <laughs> it has a Rotten Tomato score of 36% and an audience score of 78%. Let's talk non-spoilers. Todd, what did you think of Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom? Uh, I'll just go on the record here, first of all, by saying that I never from the get-go liked Jason Momoa's casting as Aquaman. I don't have anything against Jason Momoa. He really seems like a down-to-earth, kind of fun-loving, you know, nice guy. Nothing personal against him. It's just he didn't fit Aquaman to me. And I know there's precedent in the comics for Aquaman being a bearded, long-haired character. I get where they were going there. But even in uh, Justice League and Aquaman 1, he had an air or sense of kind of being a badass. He kind of had like a badass attitude. Right. We get right here, all that is completely fucking out the window and lost. It's, I mean, you know, we've joked back and forth to ourselves. We've called it Aqua Bro. Mm -hmm. He's just playing a bro. Yeah, uh, you know, you know, beer swilling, you know, good time having, good old motorcycle boy. riding. He's basically maybe playing Jason Momoa. Yeah, exactly. And it just, it just didn't work for me. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. I'm gonna. This is uh, another uh, for this to be the the last film of the DCEU. It's it's pretty sad, but it's nothing that we hadn't kind of expected. True. You know, we 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 looked at what happened with the flash and we looked at the trailers for this film and we said at best it'll be pretty and mediocre. And I think in this case it's pretty and bad. Yeah. It's not, it, it, it the first one kind of it survived on a serviceable story propped up by great visuals. great visuals. This has pretty good visuals and a very lackluster kind of piss poor story. Exactly. And um, like I said, for this to be the last DCU film, I mean, say what you will about the DCU, but it's kind of almost fitting in a way. That <laughs> it, it is. Go it goes out with a whimper. <clears throat> um, and it, it, it's kind of fitting that not only does it go out, but the man who kind of set it up for failure that we just got d d done discussing <laughs> in Zack Snyder. Right. How fitting that he has another terrible movie released in the same weekend as the final DCEU film. It's kind of like everything comes home to roost. Yeah, it's like poetry. It. Everything rhymes, baby. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, do, do I recommend this film? I, I, I don't recommend that you go out and spend your money on it. Um, give it a watch when it hits max. Sure. If you're already subscribing to max, don't go out and spend your money on this. It's not worth your time, honestly. Um, unless you're just, unless you love Jason Momoa, um, as Aquaman and you're just a big fan of Jason Momoa or, you know, you want to go like look at him for the eye candy if you're uh, yeah, you something know. like that. I, I get it, but like uh, from a story perspective, from a character perspective, from a, a, a good comic book film, this is none of those things. It doesn't do the character justice in my eyes. I I kind of agree with you. I, Jason Momoa was never my first choice. Wouldn't have been my first choice for an Aquaman. I think he was. I was all right with him in his portrayal in 
like Justice League and like the Snyder Cut and like right. some of what we've seen in Aquaman 1. But like I said, I think here they just kind of knew, hey, this is it, boys. I'm just going to be Jason Momoa. Like, you know, yeah. that's that's who I'm going to be. I'm not Arthur Curry. I'm not Aquaman. I'm just Jason I'm Momoa just in an orange suit. And uh, that's, that's kind of what you get here. So uh, would you recommend it, Todd? I wouldn't. I would not recommend you go out and pay to watch it. If you're already a Mac subscriber or you want to wait for it to hit there or you want to rent it when it hits digital, that may be fine, but don't waste your hard-earned money to go see it in no theater. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, before we discuss the film in detail, let's play another round of How Many Stars. Nice. Todd, I have five audience reviews for Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom here. I'll read your review, and you tell me from one to five how many stars you think the person gave the film. Uh, there is one half-star review, Todd. Oh, there is a half this yes. time. Okay. Alan says, entertaining from start to finish. Too much college dude vibes sometimes, but it gets the job done. How many stars? I'm going to say he gave it a four. Three stars. Ah. Jose R. says, it's somewhat entertaining, but it's very sloppy editing just to take Mira out of the film. The trend of really bad second part DC films continues. How many stars? Two stars. Two stars. Hey. Justin Bainey says, this is a little bit of a long one, we get it, Hollywood believes in global warming, but apparently they don't believe in making any more good superhero movies. The worst way to end any DC Extended Universe plot was just discovered under the Arctic, but the story melted away within a few moments, as you could easily tell, we are to blame the humans for everything. Apparently, every single actor gave as minimal of effort as possible for the end of their DC acting contract, from unbelievable prepubescent fighting of two brothers who are over 40, to the short, meaningless backstory rushed through in flashbacks, and finally a post-climax scene that would be expected to be an ending movie clip of a Disneyland hero ride, all bad. This leaves a worse taste in your mouth than the octopus spit Aquaman encounters in the movie. P.S. Do not see this movie in 3D. Trust me on this. You'll hear way more about that fiasco for this film in tech articles elsewhere. How many stars? It's got to be the half. That's our half star. Yes. Vasily Wilcox says, Great visually stunning, world-trotting, action buddy comedy adventure. It's got great acting and music and camera work. Great movie for everyone. How many That's stars? It's got to be the five. That's a five star. Okay. And finally, Cosmic Slop Shop says, <laughs> "Okay, DCE, DCEU is finally over. How many stars? One. Three stars. Ah. Good job, pal. So let's discuss <coughs> Aqua Bro in depth. Spoilers are ahead. Todd, start us off. Where do you want to begin? Uh, you know, I had read an online review before we went to see this the other night, and the reviewer kind of said, like, hey, the first 30 to 45 minutes of this movie, a little slow, a little slow. So I was kind of going in expecting that. I'm like, you know, I'm going to get ready. This may be a slow burn at first, but maybe it'll pick up. Not really. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't characterize it as a slow burn. Yeah. Anyway. I think it's pretty much par for the course of what you get yeah. before. I mean, you kind of start off with what uh, kind of a uh, – uh, compilation scene of Aquaman's life now after becoming the king of Atlantis. And a dad. And a dad. You know, he's uh, trying to solve the problems of the, the 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 seven seas, and he's trying to, like, get baby piss out of his mouth. Yeah, why do people that make movies already think it's funny to have a baby piss on the parents? It's like, a, it's like <laughs> one of the oldest tropes there is in, like, parenting a baby kind of, like, in, anything to do with parenting a baby in the film is like, oh... It, it made a shit and it stinks or yeah. it, oh, it took pissed off. off. It yeah. pissed all over it me. It pissed on me. It's like one of the oldest cliches. Yeah, I don't I don't I don't understand. I'm not sure maybe maybe there's people out there that enjoy that that humor, but it doesn't really do anything for me these days. I actually go so far one time to have Mira direct the piss into Aquaman's mouth. Like Yeah. <laughs> I <laughs> forgot <laughs> about that honestly. Yeah, you're right. Only in the second part of the compilation where we come yeah. back to repeat the same joke. Yeah, only to he, drive it home even further. Yeah, Aqua Bro dodges the piss. It's only to have Mira uh, redirect like, said yes. piss into his mouth. Yes, if only uh, if only R. Kelly could use Mira's powers. Hey, <laughs> whoa! Does that, it was a bit of a joke grenade I was, when it, it hit. It, it hit. hit. You, it got you. I was like, huh? that oh, too cerebral for you, Ty. <laughs> Uh, I was thinking about, you know, why is he uh, hanging out in his costume on the line to dry when he's the king of the sea? Yeah, and <laughs> the, and that, that's the thing, too, that I didn't think about till just now. Like, that costume is very – it's uh, 
when, when it's on, it's it has a very metallic armory type feel. Right. But then it's just something that you could like string over a clothesline, like it's made out of like cotton. Yeah, spandex. It, it yeah. does it. It doesn't kind of make sense. Like, which is it? Is it a kind of an armor kind of scale chainmail type? feel to it or is it just like you said is it like spandex on the clothesline just another kind of I guess inconsistency there yeah I think maybe for me personally in the first one uh, where maybe he wasn't in as much I didn't mind it as much but here it's like the more he's in that suit the worse it looks to me I think yeah and then he gets another suit in this film like probably to sell toys or to market um, right. you know something else for people to buy I guess whatever that is for another hot toy that they can have. kind of that blue uh, stealth suit yeah a stealth suit that gives him like a minute of invisibility right um, I, they put they put it to use in the film but doesn't not a costume or a, a, a power for a costume to have that I would give to Aquaman really uh, an invisibility suit. Not the first character that I would say that needs a stealth invisibility suit on land. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? He doesn't use it in the water. Yeah. He uses it on land. Uh, there was a time when he had a little mini series back in the day in the comics where he don't, wore like don't a... Don't tell me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> where he wore like a, a bluish don't type... Don't defend this. That was supposed to look like he was blending in with the water currents, but he's not even using it in the, this movie in the water. He's in the desert. That kind of sounds cool. And in the first movie, don't they go to a desert? And then in this movie, they go back to they a desert. They go to a desert in both films. In yes. both films. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> uh, so so w- what's the plot here, Todd? What, what's, what's, what are we doing here this time? Uh, so basically after, you know, we're reestablishing Aquaman, you know, he's the king of Atlantis now, he's got a family, he's married to Mira, he's got, uh, Arthur Jr., their baby, uh, we also get reintroduced to Black Manta, and Black Manta is on the hunt for Atlantean tech, he's trying to fix his Black Manta suit, which was damaged in their first battle, and he comes upon, uh, or actually one of his scientists comes upon this, uh, kind of, they fall into this fissure in the ice, I'm guessing they're in the Antarctic, yeah, some Arctic circle somewhere, somewhere cold. like that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, basically they stumble upon what is we're going to come to know as the Lost Kingdom. There was like, see, I think they said it was a seventh kingdom of Atlantis, right, or of the underwater realms, and uh, Necris. I Necris, think is, is yes. eventually what we learned is to be called. And uh, uh, Black Man actually stumbles upon the two broken halves of what is called the Dark Trident. I believe it Black is Black Trident. Black Trident, Dark Trident. And, uh, and upon touching the Trident, he has visions of. Uh, the ruler of that uh, lost uh, civilization, and he's trying to speak to him like, you know, you know, reassemble this and do this and reawaken me, and you have all the powers and dreams you've ever wanted, some suchy such. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, I'm gonna butcher. I'm gonna butcher his name. Um, but what did you think of? I think it's Yahya Abdul Mateen the second. Is who is our uh, who plays Black Manta? What did you think of his performance, Todd? He to me is probably the best thing in this movie. Uh, you know, and he's playing. I thought he did an excellent job in the first one, just as you know, black regular Black Manta. Mm-hmm. And you know, when he gets that tried and he starts getting possessed by that old king, and he's going a little bit off his rocker. Right. But then I got to thinking about a part in the movie, and we'll, I don't know if we want to touch on it now, but when he kind of shows up at the Curry home, you want to hit that a little later? At the lighthouse? Yeah, the lighthouse. Sure, we can hit it now. Okay, here's the thing. So when he's he's got the black trident, and, you know, he's on his mission, and, you know, there's this scene where I think his scientist is kind of questioning about what he's doing. Yeah, Randall Park from, yeah. from Marvel fame. But yeah, uh, just let me I'll, – I'll just set this part up. So Black Manta's plan to – to uh, release Necros, he is buried in the ice right. in the Arctic. So the plan is to use a a resource that can be found, I guess, under the ocean somewhere uh, called orichalcum. Orichalcum. To to steal as much of that as possible, to release it into the atmosphere, to speed up the greenhouse gas effect, to basically, uh, you know, ignite global warming. And to kind of melt that those ice caps so he can get to Necros, really. That's the gist of the plan for the film and what he, what they're trying to accomplish through most of the film. Anyway. And so he has that little scene there, and, you know, his scientist is kind of questioning about what he's doing or what his motives are. And I'm kind of paraphrasing. Basically, he says, I'm going to kill Aquaman. I'm going to lay waste and destroy everything he loves and holds dear. Mm-hmm. So he loses a little <laughs> bit of cred for me when he goes to said lighthouse, and I won't say right now who's in said lighthouse. No, but, go ahead, you're fine. Uh, We're in spoilers. Uh, okay, it's Aquaman's father and his little son, <laughs> Boba Fett. Yes, yeah, Boba Fett and Aquaman's baby. Right. Neither one of them should have been alive 
when black men have stepped out of that place. I mean, at least, at least uh, we, we've been pro kill the baby. <laughs> we've been team kill the baby since From we, the since the idea was floated that it potentially could kill the baby in this film. Uh, spoiler alert: they don't kill the baby. Nope. Uh, uh, another additional to that: no one fucking dies. There's no stakes. There's no stakes whatsoever, which I have in my notes as well. No stakes whatsoever. But at the very least, his dad should have died. Yeah. And like you said, he 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 has this big villain speech I'm gonna kill Aquaman I'm gonna tear down everything he loves and blah 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 Burn and everything. then he goes there and he's like he stabs his dad he's like I'm gonna leave you alive so that he can find you like yeah. he t- I can't remember exactly what he says but I'm gonna he's like I'm gonna leave you alive so he can watch you die and then they get there and Aquaman's like no and then like some of the people Atlantean people or something come in and I'm like he's gonna be fine yeah, <laughs> like his you know, dad's fine. He recovers. Yeah, baby winds up being fine. There's know? no stakes. He's still the best part of the movie to me, Black Manna and the and the actor that played him. But you know, he lost a little bit of credit yeah. to me right there. You don't. You didn't kill the baby. You didn't kill it. You couldn't even kill his dad. You didn't kill Orm. You didn't kill Mira, unfortunately. And she was one I thought would maybe go of any of them exactly. because of who's playing her. Exactly. <laughs> There's no stakes. And like at. Why not? It's the last one. Yeah. It's the last one. Uh, Jason Momoa was not coming back as Aquaman. This film franchise is not continuing. It's where's, in the grave already. Go the, for it. Where's the stakes? Go for it. Like, at least kill somebody. Yeah. Make me think someone has a possibility to die. And, like, I knew if the baby didn't die in the lighthouse scene, the baby wouldn't die. Yeah. You can't just kill the baby in the third act. You got to have time to kill the baby and be sad about the baby dying and then get revenge for the baby dying. Right. Like, you can't just, like, throw a trident in the baby's face in the third act. <laughs> it don't work like that. Right. Uh, but, yeah, it just, like you said, there's there's absolutely no no stakes here. Uh, speaking of Amber Heard, what did, you, what did you think about her performance in the film? She just seemed like. Her dialogue seemed off, like her dialogue delivery. Like she didn't give a shit. Probably. <laughs> or shit. Key word. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. Every every word of dialogue she speaks, and she only speaks like three lines in the film. She's yeah. only in like maybe five scenes in the whole thing. Uh, and some most of those are just reacting or just using her powers and she doesn't speak. But every time she does open her mouth, it is like... It, it's so cringe. Because Seems like the most phoned in thing ever. Exactly. She has no, I don't know, like there's nothing dynamic about her performance. She doesn't seem to care. Seems like she's just there to just to be there because she had to be here because she wanted a paycheck or whatever it was. But just completely phones it in here if you're asking me. Um, I mean, other performances in the film, you got Dolph Lundgren. He's overacting the hell out of this thing. Right. Uh, John Reese Davies is a uh, crab that loses. Crab a people. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like he gets on my nerves here. Uh, we got Nicole Kidman as uh, you know uh, Aquaman's mother. Why doesn't Nicole Kidman's face move, Todd? I don't. She had some good work done. Is it good work or, or bad work? Yeah. I don't know. Because her face don't move. It's beautiful like, woman. Don't get me wrong. Beautiful. Yeah, Listen, but, like you know. Days of Thunder era, Nicole Kidman, Batman Forever. Batman Forever, Nicole Kidman. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, yeah, her face just don't move no more. Um, so to to find Black Manta, Aqua Bro needs to bust out his brother, Orm, who is in prison on this, like, in this desert, uh, you know, in the desert somewhere. Yeah, and I get that because, you know, like Aquaman, he draws some of his power from the sea, so you got to keep him away from the water. Yeah, I mean, that that's <laughs> fine. And it's like the the reasoning for breaking out Orm is pretty thin. It's like, well, I don't know. He's got Black Manna's phone number. Yeah, he or, knows a lot about Black Manna. Yeah. Let's we, bust him He out. doesn't know anything about Black I can't Black figure Manor. out shit on my own. Yeah. We got to go get Orm. And Orm doesn't know anything about him other than, like, the person that put him in contact with him, which is apparently Martin Short playing some kind of weird key, Jabba the Hutt character. He's playing Jabba the Hutt. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so him and Orm, he busts Orm out in a – decent little scene with some kind of wonky CG and some kind of weird looking creature things like yeah, skeleton bony cre- looking yeah. skeletal monsters yeah like 
and they, 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 you know, they have the fight on the beach, and he goes from like Orm goes from Captain America skinny to like as soon as he like touches the water, he goes to like you know bulked up, yeah. like taking HGH. Barry I just bones. thought of it. it's like bones to buff, B to B, bones to buff. He just ramming them off. Today. I'm, I'm on it today, yeah, folks. Just bones to buff. We may never stop recording. I'm feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so like yeah, but they end up at like this pirate haven place. Does it bug? Did, did you think about this? Because it bugged me. Like they go to this pirate haven, and it's like you know this. Uh, you know, it's what the name is. This pirate haven is a bunch of weird creatures and people that somehow underwater. And again, it's like Michael, uh, not Michael Short, uh, Martin Short is like Jabba the Hutt type character. Um, did you notice there's like three or four people? I think including Martin Short, Kingfish character, whatever his name is, that's like drinking some type of uh, underwater ocean booze. How does that work? <laughs> how do you drink how you, underwater? How are you, how you even doing that? How, do, how, you, how, you, how, you, how you doing that, how guy? How you even doing that? Like, it don't, don't make no sense that you would be drinking <laughs> other liquids. I don't know. It's just stuff that, and I don't know. It's just stuff that bugs me. Just like, I don't know. Like, how does that work? But they get whatever information they're looking for from uh, Martin Short, and then they go off to uh, some jungly looking place that's like, Something out of Kong Skull Island with some weird big yeah. cockroaches and it's where they've got that temple that they're pumping that or uh, a cow Miralax or whatever. <laughs> Mir- <laughs> <laughs> the Mir- Guys, this film's covered in shit. Yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Miralax. Yeah, they they go to the Orichalcum Island where they're pumping all the stuff, the the the, the Bond villain layer basically yeah. for Black Manta. And here's the thing I wanted to ask you, or the thing that I caught, because you know, when they start pumping that stuff into the atmosphere, we start seeing, like, these TV broadcasts, like, you know, temperatures on the rise, mass flood, tornadoes, you know, it's just it's screwing up the Earth's atmosphere. And, right. You know, we're in the dark. What's going on here? Well, how, what's going on? How do we figure this out? Well, there's this big-ass temple in the jungle just pumping this green shit straight you up in the atmosphere. You see that. You, but then, you know, uh, Orm dropped this little thing. Now, now, I mean, he ain't been there like five minutes. You, I just Did you catch it? He's like, they must have something, something, something. That's why nobody's figured out what's happening here. I do remember, <laughs> I do remember a line like that, but, yeah, I, did, I don't remember exactly what he said. It's like, we got to gloss over the fact that, you know, we've been pumping this green shit in the atmosphere. That anybody for, flying in the South yeah, Pacific would have saw. could see this. <laughs> it could easily be seen on radar or satellite. Yeah. But, yeah, we've got to cover the they fact. They have an Enclosed something, something. That's why they haven't figured this out yet. <laughs> that's the level. It's the level of writing you get here, folks. Uh, did Did you enjoy the bl- uh, the brotherly buddy cop dynamic between Not Arthur all. and Orm? No, I didn't. Yeah, it's 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 too much of that kind of bro humor. Um, I'm gonna, I've got it in my notes here, but let me, let me go ahead and talk about it. So we'll, we'll come back to the big part of it. But uh, there's a joke that's completely fumbled in that jungle scene. Oh, really? Okay, I didn't catch it. In terms of, I think you'll know what I'm talking about. So, like, um, they're they're kind of going through, and uh, Arthur's talking about, oh, you know, I'd love to have a beer and a cheeseburger right now, and I'm chasing Momoa, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> right. And, like, Orm's like, oh, that sounds disgusting with your, like, disgusting, you know, land-dwelling food and all this. Like, oh, you've never had a cheeseburger, and blah, blah, blah. And then he, he finds a cockroach. Oh, yeah. Aquaman does. And he tells them that it's like a delicacy of, like, land dwellers that they that they love. And so Orm tastes it and crunches down on it, and he kind of likes it, right? Yeah. And then you expect the joke there to be, Aquaman to be like, Hi, you dumbass. <laughs> that was a cockroach. That was a fucking cockroach. We don't <laughs> eat those. That's disgusting. You're right. But you're instead, right. he just kind of walks off and leading you to believe, Aquaman, he's fucking cockroaches. <laughs> Because he don't say anything. He just acts like it's normal. Like, yeah. Like, it's, yeah, we eat cockroaches. Where does he hang out? He eats cockroaches. The joke is supposed to be that, like, kind of like, you know, if you're fucking around with your brother or, like, busting somebody's balls. Here, like, eat you, this. It's good. Exactly. Like, you stupid ass. Stupid ass. You That's just nasty. A, you eat a damn cockroach. But he's like, I guess Aquaman likes cockroaches. I guess so. That's what hmm. the fumble joke there leads you to believe that the way it's played, it's uh, it's like, okay, I okay. guess I, Aquaman eats cockroaches. Nice. It's just, that's, again, that's the level of writing that you're getting in this film. Uh-huh. Overall, it's just, I don't know, pretty terrible. Um, so basically, I guess our third act really, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the, the lighthouse scene. So, uh, what's his name? Cordax. Cordax is the big 
the big bad that is behind the visions that Black Manta is, and he's, who's communicating with Black Manta. Or basically anybody that picks up that trident. Yeah. Is, is, yeah. You know. Later on, Orm grabs it. It's right. like, hey, you want to do a murder? <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> anybody that touches that trident, <laughs> you know. Um, but like part of that, we learn not only does he have the orichalcum that's like pumping it and like trying to melt the ice or whatever. Uh, the ice that's enclosing Cordax is not actually ice. It's blood magic ice. Oh. So you have to have the blood of the royal family. Yes. And that's why you get the lighthouse scene because they're like, Orm's like, well, there's only I've got royal blood and mom's got royal blood. And you, Arthur, you've got royal blood. Who that's else has, got, who else has got it? Damn. Oh, I didn't mention I have a whole ass baby at the house. So that's why Black Mana steals the baby. He wants to use the baby's blood to free Cordax. Um, so I guess Cordax can grant him power or give him his army to take take in, uh, to, I guess, for him to basically destroy Atlantis or whatever. And so the third act of the film is basically them uh, – Going to back to I guess I guess this, is it the Arctic they go back to I think they're back in the Arctic yeah they Looks go back like they take Dolph Lundgren and Crab Man and a few forces and you're kind of expecting the big battle like you got from Aquaman one but you don't get that. you don't really get it it's man. it's like a very quick like uh, John Reese Davies Crab Man is like well you've got them I'll I will take these people on like you go ahead and like they have a little battle that kind of quickly cuts away from and it's mostly just Orm, Arthur, and a little bit of Mira going right. into the little temple there. Uh, there's a moment with Dolph Lundgren where he gets grabbed, where they're, they're kind of scaling this, scaling the, the ruins or whatever, and he gets grabbed by like a tentacle monster that that guy from Rebel Moon was fucking. <laughs> and, and there's a moment where you think he's looking for Orm for help because he's, he's the most distrustful of Orm. And you have this little moment where Orm's like, I'm going to let you die. And they should have left and they it should right have, there. And they should have let it. They should have. It would have been a good little moment. Mm-hmm. Again, why, like, you got nothing else. It's over. It's the last one. Why not? Who yeah. gives a fuck? Because earlier in that scene before they get there, you know, uh, Dolph Lundgren's character is, like, passing out rifles to everybody. Mm-hmm. And he only gives Orm, like, a bladed weapon. He gives, like, a he, he, yeah, action. Yeah, because he don't trust him. Exactly. So you would have had a good little moment just to, like, he still got that little evil he in still him. still got that touch he, of evil. Exactly. Like, for yeah, him fuck to, you, Dolph. You exactly. Did. And <laughs> Dolph is, like, overacting the fuck out of the yeah. scene anyway. Um, but Orm comes back around and saves him. Yeah, of course Orm gets comes. Gets him a rifle, gets his trust. Exactly. <laughs> uh, take us through the, the, the last little ending bit here, Todd. What happens at the end? So basically we're right there where Amantha is, is uh, trying to get the, to get whatever the blood he needs, any way he can get it out of that baby to mm. get that, uh, what is it, the blood seal broke open so he can free the king. Yeah, and he's having this like moment where he's got the knife over the baby. He's like, "I'm gonna stab his baby. It'd be him. a shame if anybody threw something <laughs> at me and stopped me from doing this." It's getting come and try to. It's getting close. <laughs> this baby's gonna die. And then, like, of course, it, the baby's saved by Aquaman throwing his trident from off screen. And so uh, they have a little skirmish, uh, Aquaman and of course Black Man. Not a bad little fight scene between them. I'll, I'll give it to them there. Right. And then uh, Orm and Mira show up, and they have a little. They kind of join in on the battle, and uh, Orm somehow gets a hold of the trident, and he joins the pieces, and he starts seeing his visions of like, you know, hey, you know, come, come back to the dark side, <laughs> right? Exactly. Be your true self. Join me. You can be the ruler of Atlantis yeah, again. Cordax is like this. He's much more powerful than the other one, and he hates you. This body hates you more than the last one did, and blah blah blah. Yeah. And so Arthur kind of has a little moment with him, like, you know, come back to me, brother. You know, I love you. You know, all this, you know, mushy-gushy family type stuff. And, right. You know, Orm gives up the black trident, and Arthur throws it, and it does absolutely nothing. <laughs> th- Cordax is released. Yeah. He throws it at Cordax. And I have it in my notes. I don't want to. I'll, I'll go into it in a minute. But he throws it at Cordax. He, Cordax catches it. Uh, Orm then passes Arthur his trident, mm. which then he throws and hits his kind of like... Yeah, it actually goes right, just perfectly right, straight down the middle it's, of Cordax's the, dark trident. like the Robin Hood shot, like yeah. splitting the arrow, basically. Yeah, he, he split a trident. And that, that starts collapsing the ruins. Uh, Black Manta falls into a pit. A nice little, decent little scene where... Arthur's offering to like his hand to pull Black Man out of the pit, and Black Man, you think he's going to take it, and he's like, never. 
I never. And falls. And falls. I, have a, I have a note about this, too. And then uh, from there, um, we get, um, I'll, I'll talk about this. It's in my notes, too. But, like, we get um, kind of, I guess, we'll, we'll, Aquaman's speech to the world. Because another little subplot of this is the Atlantean Council doesn't want uh, Arthur to reveal Atlantis to exactly the public and use their um, their you know to give them access and to share their information and technology with the rest of the world. At the end of the film, he has his moment of like speaking at a at a kind of a press conference type thing outdoors in front of the water on the waterway and like has his little like you know we're gonna share our information and share our our wealth with you and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we're Atlantis and we're here to stay. And I'm Jason Momoa. Yee-hoo. And that's, (laughs) that's, that's basically, and the last line, and this, this is, this goes to my note here. The last, (laughs) the last line of the DCEU is a derivative ripoff of the I am Iron Man line from, from 2008's Iron Man. How, how dumb, but yet how fitting that you steal a line from a much more successful movie and a much more successful series of films overall right. to be your last line of this DCU. That's the last spoken line in the film. I have it in my notes here. Is uh, um, is, a, is I am Aquaman, ye who, as he dives <laughs> into the water. Just being as Jason Momoa as he possibly could be. Right. How fitting is it that that's the last line here, Todd? It's it's almost like the chef kiss bow on the whole thing. Yeah. It's just perfectly summed There's up. one more. Well, I wanna, oh, I wanna, no. I wanna Hang go with in, us, folks. I want to go into it. There's one more, even more fitting than that. But, like, <coughs> how how just how funny to me that the last is, like, a stolen derivative line from, from Iron Man with I am Aquaman. Like, makes no sense. Yeah. It doesn't fit. And it just makes no sense yeah, narratively. Here it just falls like dead weight to the fucking floor. You could have heard a pin drop in yeah. the theater. I mean, there wasn't anybody hardly in there anyway. True. But still. Um, so uh, before I go through my notes, like what, what elements of the film did you like, Todd? Uh, as I was saying before, I'm not even going to try that name, but the actor who portrayed Black Manna, mm-hmm. I, I think he was still probably my best thing about these movies. Even though, you know, he ain't as badass as I thought he was because, you know, he don't kill nobody. <laughs> <laughs> right. And not to keep harping on that, but you're talking about a universe where they let Pa Kent get swept away by a tornado. They fucking killed Jimmy Olsen because they didn't know what the fuck to do with him. Yeah, he was a CIA agent. They yeah. got shot in the head. Just got shot in the head, and you, you can't even just kill Aquaman's dad. <laughs> just his dad. I mean, let the kid, you know, I understand that's right. a little baby. Who's going to kill fucking little babies this day and age? Nobody. Right. But you could have killed his dad. Yeah. There's, like I said, there's no stakes. There's no There's no threat. There, you don't believe for a second anybody's in any kind of real narrative danger at all in the film. And there is that cool little scene, keep going back to the lighthouse, but, you know, where Black Manta cuts the power, and it's dark in there, and Arthur's father's going fumbling for a flashlight, and you just see Manda's eyes light up red in the hallway. That's, I like that. That's badass. <laughs> <laughs> not not much you're grasping at here, Todd. There's not. I mean, Jason Momoa had the time of his life being himself in this movie, and I'll tip my hat to him. If you're allowed to do that, if somebody gives you a bunch of money and is like, hey, man. Just go have that and be right. you, bro. Exactly. Do it. Fucking do it. <laughs> uh, let's go through some of my notes here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over some of the stuff that we have. Something that uh, doesn't really come back in the film, but Aqua Baby is showing that he can talk to fish as well. That's true. Um, Black Man needs to heat up the planet to thaw Kordax, but not really. As we talked about, he... He's released by blood magic, not really so much melting the ice around him. We need it's not to pump real. all that Miralax in the atmosphere after all. Uh, <laughs> Randall Park, you mentioned the scientist that's working with Black Man and Randall Park, uh, just getting on my fucking nerves in this movie. Just go away. Go back to Marvel. He's like, annoying here. Uh, Aquaman drinks Guinness, one of the most disgusting beers on the planet. Uh, Black Manus needs to steal Ori Calcum. Uh, the whole time, everybody, in, anytime anybody would say Ori Calcum, I'm like, why does that? What does it remind me of? And I, it reminds me of the seal of Ori Calcos from Yu-Gi-Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. 
Mira doesn't die after being blasted by black man as eye beams. Minus one point. <laughs> Aquaman, whose whole deal is communicating with sea creatures, does not use this power to have any sea creatures follow Black Manta sub. So you remember the part where they steal the Orichalcum right out of Atlantis? Right. And they have this, like, sonic pulse device that, like, they shoot at Aquaman and stuff. They kind of derail some kind of underwater train, and Aquaman has to deal with that. Exactly. He could have dispatched something to follow that sub. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, he, he doesn't say, hey, that octopus they've been using the whole time in Topo. the movie. Topo. Topo. Or, hey, like, whoop, 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 whoop. hey, uh, you know, goldfish, follow this yeah. sub. Or, like, just you could have done something like, he never hardly uses that power anyway. Later on, they he calls 100 whales to, like, destroy the sub with a whale song but like you don't really use his powers that's like that's his main power big thing that's his thing it's his his only thing thing. it's his literally his only thing uh nicole kidman i don't know if you caught this nicole kidman uh, mispronounces ori calcum she calls it ori colcum then pronounces (laughs) it correctly after someone else says it correctly Colk. Colk. uh i wrote down why martin short why for money (laughs) <laughs> Was that it, Marty? A quick voiceover, a few dollar bills. Um, the uh, we talked about the uh, the 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 tricking MD, the cockroach gag already. Um, our father doesn't die, Mira doesn't die, Orm doesn't die, Aqua Baby doesn't die. Film has no stakes. We kind of mentioned. Uh, did I mention Mira doesn't die? Minus another point. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Black Manta entrusts the baby that carries the blood he needs to unleash Kordax to a man that was previously shown to be having a crisis of, of conscience about helping him. He gives the baby to Randall Park, who's shown him many times he's, having, he's having the crisis <laughs> of conscience about helping him. And so Randall switches out the baby in the little bag or whatever for a bomb and tries to like kind of betray him and and and, and uh, kind of take the baby. But yeah, why why would you trust him with the baby of, of, of every smart black man of everybody? Not not smart. <laughs> um, Cordax is unleashed and does nothing but catch the black trident that was thrown at him and then continues to hold it up to his face long enough for Arthur to throw his trident at him. I uh, he, he even, I don't know if you noticed it, but he, he's holding it up to his face for a good amount of time. Mm-hmm. He even peeks around and looks at Aquaman while he's still holding it to his fucking face <laughs> well before he throws the second trident. He's like, today, guys? Right. Are you going to throw this through my <laughs> face or, or what? <coughs> Um, uh, Black Manta falls into a pit and dies. This death grants him no dignity as he bounces off every rock like a cast iron skillet. Damn. <laughs> uh, we talked about the last spoken line. Uh, and here's, uh, here's my last two notes, Todd. So we mentioned the last line, how, how fitting it was to be stolen from Iron Man. After, if I'd have told you 10 years ago, so this Man of Steel come out in 2013, right. now 2023. So if I'd have told you 10 years ago when we first sit down to watch Man of Steel, uh, as divisive as that was and uh, kind of, uh, you know, all that that kind of fell out from that. But if I'd have told you 10 years ago that the final shot was a mid credit scene the final shot of the DCEU was of Aquaman's brother sitting at an outdoor restaurant, placing a cockroach onto his cheeseburger and eating it. What would I you would have, said? have said, you are crazy, sir. There's no way DC and Warner Bros. will let something like that happen. Yeah. They'll course correct this thing. <laughs> They'll come back bigger and better. But they didn't. Talk. They didn't. <laughs> the, the, the final shot of the DCEU is Orm sitting and putting a cockroach on a cheeseburger and eating it. That's the last thing you'll ever see in the DCEU. That's your final takeaway from the DC Cinematic Universe. It's not, hey, like one last time, like let's get everybody back together and like have just a little stinger at the end. Maybe it's like running towards, flying towards camera, camera flying uh, at, at the Legion of you know supervillains or something, or Legion of Doom, right? Or uh, how about we have as many people as we can get back? Henry Cavill and Ben Affleck, maybe they're up in the Watchtower in space and they're like a six signal goes off and the league is needed or maybe just a compilation of the last 10 years of the good stuff that you yeah, had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As your post-credit, no. none of that. No. Or meeting a cockroach. That's where <laughs> we go out on, baby. That's it. And my last note here, uh, Mira doesn't die minus one final point. <laughs> uh, it's on a couple more questions I had for you here. Um, is Aquaman in the Lost Kingdom better than The Flash? Yikes. I'm going to say, I'm going to say no. 
it's not better than the Flash. You no. Would, so you would watch. You would prefer the Flash over. I this. would watch the Flash over this only because, and here we go, folks. Michael Keaton is in it as Batman. Right. <laughs> and that's I've, the only. I reason. struggle to answer that question. I gotta go back and forth even now. So I, it's hard to really say. But yeah, I, I kind of tend to agree with you because only because of the Michael Keaton stuff. But then I'm like, if I have to sit down and watch that again, I also have to watch Ezra Miller. And would I prefer to watch Ezra Miller doing his stupid shit or watch Jason Momoa do his stupid shit? It in a more visually appealing film, true. Because true. in a flash, I got to sit through CGI monstrosities of Christopher Reeve and everybody else. You got to see that tooth fall out of his head again. I got to see George Clooney. Like, yeah. Uh, so I struggle with it too. I'm, I'm not really sure, honestly. Uh, if you could change one thing about the film to improve it, what would it be? Kill that baby. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, final question for you, Todd. After seeing this film, uh, who would you uh, or would you want Jason Momoa to play Lobo in the DCU? I would still say yes. I mean, he's basically been playing Lobo <laughs> since he's been here. It seems inevitable that he's going to play Lobo in the DCU, and I mean, I think that's probably much more up his alley and much closer to who he is as a person and closer to how, like you said, he was acting in these films. It just nails his personality. He's He's got it already. Yeah. Just, so, just sign him up. Exactly. Uh, I had this uh, to, to share with you. This, this is not mine. This is uh, the top 10 DCU moments. This is uh, via the Geek League of America on Facebook. I just found this funny. Um, from 1 to 10, I don't think they're really in a specific order. I think they're kind of ordered by the film. Uh, number one, Superman commits violent murder in Man of Steel. Moment number two, the Flash tries to rescue several uh, terrible-looking CGI babies from an exploding hospital and puts one into a microwave. Moment three, Superman and Batman stop fighting each other because Batman realizes both of their mother's names are Martha, and Ben Affleck proceeds to deliver the line, why did you say that name in the most cringeworthy way possible? Moment four, Wonder Woman rescues, quote-unquote, two Arab children by snatching them off of the ground in mid-swing, then loses her grip on her magic lasso, causing her to land directly on top of them on pavement, which actually should have crushed and killed them. Wow. Moment five, Pa Kent tells young Clark that he may be should have let a bus full of kids drown. Mm. Moment six, director David Ayer makes the Joker look like a methed out juggalo complete with chrome grill and forehead tattoos and suicide squad. Yikes. Moment seven, Gail uh, Gadot delivers one of the worst line readings in the history of Superman movies. Tell them, no. <laughs> Moment eight, Warner Brothers shamelessly plasters the screen with the hideous CGI reanimated corpses of Christopher Reeve, Adam West, George Reeves, and other old DC characters in The Flash. Moment nine, a baby pisses into a character's mouth no less than three times in Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. And moment 10, the CGI super lips from the Joss Whedon cut. <laughs> super lips. Super lips. <laughs> <laughs> Those are your top 10 DCU moments. Uh, it's brought to you by the Geek League of America on wow. Facebook. Uh, Todd, you ready to do a review? I'm ready. We rank films using a 1 to 10 scale, as I mentioned before. Starting from 1, we've got 1, Torture, 2, Awful, 3, Bad, 4, Sapar, 5, Mediocre, 6, Decent, 7, Good, 8, Great, 9, Amazing, and 10, Masterpiece. Todd, give us any final thoughts and your review score for Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. Aquaman 2, unfortunately for me, is like a lot of the now-ended DCEU. Some visually amazing aspects brought down by poor storytelling decisions, bad characterization, and casting decisions that didn't quite pan out. And if we're being honest here, for a universe that began with a lot of doom and gloom and angst, you had a shot here to put up on screen the most tragic event in Aquaman's comic book history, but instead you went with cockroach-eating gags and just letting Jason Momoa be himself, and more gags and nonsense ensued. I give Aquaman 2 a 4, which is subpar on our scale. I give Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom a 3 out of 10, Todd which ranks it as bad. I gave it a little bit worse than you. Uh, I think it's right on. I can't, like I said, I can't decide if, if it's worse than The Flash or not. So I gave it the same exact rating I gave The Flash, which was a three, and both films rank as bad. Uh, Todd, can you tell everyone how they can find us and stay up to date with us on social media? We are at Tal Capes on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Tal Capes Podcast on Facebook. You can also email us at talcapespod at gmail.com. Also, if you're so obliged, leaving us a five-star review on your podcast app of choice really helps the show. Be on the lookout for this week's Popcorn Mumbles, where we'll be talking about the 2022 film Violent Night. 
Tile Capes will return next week. Uh, next week, we want to thank you so much for listening. Till next time, bye, guys. See you, guys.